distinguished delegates to the world's parliament of religions, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the afternoon session of the opening day today, the 11th of September, 1893. We now introduce you to Swami Vivekananda from India and request him to address us. Swami Vivekananda. Sisters and brothers of America. It fills my heart with joy unspeakable to rise in response to the warm and cordial welcome which you have given us. I thank you in the name of the most ancient order of monks in the world. I thank you in the name of the mother of religions. And I thank you in the name of the millions and millions of Hindu people of all classes and sects. My thanks also to some of the speakers on this platform who, referring to the delegates from the Orient, have told you that these men from far-off nations may well claim the honor of bearing to different lands the idea of toleration. I am proud to belong to a religion which has taught the world both tolerance and universal acceptance. We believe not only in universal toleration, but we accept all religions as true. I am proud to belong to a nation which has sheltered the persecuted and the refugees of all religions and all nations of the earth. I am proud to tell you that we have gathered in our bosom the purest remnant of the Israelites who came to southern India and took refuge with us in the very year in which their holy temple was shattered to pieces by Roman tyranny. I am proud to belong to the religion which has sheltered and is still fostering the remnant of the grand Zoroastrian nation. I will quote to you, brethren, a few lines from a hymn which I remember to have repeated from my earliest boyhood, which is every day repeated by millions of human beings. As the different streams, having their sources in different places, all mingle their water in the sea, so, O oh Lord, the different paths which men take through different tendencies, various though they appear, crooked or straight, all lead to thee. The present convention, which is one of the most august assemblies ever held, is in itself a vindication, a declaration to the world of the wonderful doctrine preached in the Gita. Whosoever comes to me, through whatsoever form, I reach him. All men are struggling through paths which in the end lead to me. Sectarianism, bigotry and its horrible descendant, fanaticism, have long possessed this beautiful earth. They have filled the earth with violence, drenched it often and often with human blood, destroyed civilization and sent whole nations to despair. Had it not been for these horrible demons, human society would be far more advanced than it is now. But their time is come, and I fervently hope that the bell that tolled this morning in honor of this convention may be the death knell of all fanaticism, of all persecutions with the sword or with the pen, and of all uncharitable feelings between persons wending their way to the same goal. Ladies and gentlemen, on the agenda for today, the 15th of September, 1893, a galaxy of eminent speakers are scheduled to address us, and it gives us great pleasure to once again invite Swami Vivekananda to speak. His subject for today, why we disagree. I will tell you a little story. You have heard the eloquent speaker who has just finished say, let us cease from abusing each other. And he was very sorry that there should be always so much variance. But I think I should tell you a story which would illustrate the cause of this variance. A frog lived in a well. It had lived there for a long time. 
It was born there and brought up there, and yet was a little small frog. Of course, the evolutionists were not there then to tell us whether the frog lost its eyes or not. But for our story's sake, we must take it for granted that it had its eyes and that it every day cleansed the water of all the worms and bacilli that lived in it with an energy that would do credit to our modern bacteriologists. In this way, it went on and became a little sleek and fat. Well, one day, another frog that lived in the sea came and fell into the well. Where are you from? I am from the sea. The sea? How big is that? Is it as big as my well? And he took a leap from one side of the well to the other. My friend, said the frog of the sea, how do you compare the sea with your little well? Then the frog took another leap and asked, is your sea so big? What nonsense you speak to compare the sea with your well. Well then, said the frog of the well, nothing can be bigger than my well. There can be nothing bigger than this. This fellow is a liar, so turn him out. That has been the difficulty all the while. I am a Hindu. I am sitting in my own little well and thinking that the whole world is my little well. The Christian sits in his little well and thinks the whole world is his well. The Mohammedan sits in his little well and thinks that is the whole world. I have to thank you of America for the great attempt you are making to break down the barriers of this little world of ours and hope that in the future the Lord will help you to accomplish your purpose. Today, the 26th of September, 1893, is the penultimate day of this Parliament of Religions at Chicago. We have listened to engrossing discourses on the religions and theologies of the participating countries in these past two weeks. In continuing the series, Swami Vivekananda will now speak on Buddhism, the fulfillment of Hinduism. The religion of the Hindus is divided into two parts, the ceremonial and the spiritual. The spiritual portion is specially studied by the monks. In that, there is no caste. A man from the highest caste and a man from the lowest may become a monk in India, and the two castes become equal. In religion, there is no caste. Caste is simply a social institution. When Buddha was teaching, Sanskrit was no more the spoken language in India. It was then only in the books of the learned. Some of Buddha's Brahmin disciples wanted to translate his teachings into Sanskrit, but he distinctly told them, I am for the poor, for the people. Let me speak in the tongue of the people. And so, to this day, the great bulk of his teachings are in the vernacular of that day in India. Whatever may be the position of philosophy, whatever may be the position of metaphysics, so long as there is such a thing as death in the world, so long as there is such a thing as weakness in the human heart, so long as there is a cry going out of the heart of man in his very weakness, there shall be a faith in God. Let us then join the wonderful intellect of the Brahmin with the heart, the noble soul, the wonderful humanizing power of the great master. Ladies and gentlemen, in a short while from now, the world's Parliament of Religions at Chicago will come to a close. And this day, the 27th of September, 1893, will go down in history as a landmark for more reasons than one. It is in the fitness of things that we now call upon Swami Vivekananda from India to address this final session. The world's parliament of religions has become an accomplished fact, and the merciful Father 
has helped those who labored to bring it into existence and crown with success their most unselfish labor. My thanks to those noble souls whose large hearts and love of truth first dreamt this wonderful dream and then realized it. My thanks to the shower of liberal sentiments that has overflowed this platform. My thanks to this enlightened audience for their uniform kindness to me and for their appreciation of every thought that tends to smooth the friction of religions. A few jarring notes were heard from time to time in this harmony. My special thanks to them for they have by their striking contrast made the general harmony the sweeter. Much has been said of the common ground of religious unity. I am not going just now to venture my own theory, but if anyone here hopes that this unity will come by the triumph of any one of the religions and the destruction of the others, to him I say, brother, yours is an impossible hope. Do I wish that the Christian would become Hindu? God forbid. Do I wish that the Hindu or Buddhist would become Christian? God forbid. The seed is put in the ground and earth and air and water are placed around it. Does the seed become the earth or the air or the water? No, it becomes a plant. It develops after the law of its own growth, assimilates the air, the earth and the water, converts them into plant substance and grows into a plant. Similar is the case with religion. The Christian is not to become a Hindu or a Buddhist, nor a Hindu or a Buddhist to become a Christian. But each must assimilate the spirit of the others and yet preserve his individuality and grow according to his own law of growth. If the parliament of religions has shown anything to the world, it is this. It has proved to the world that holiness, purity, and charity are not the exclusive possessions of any church in the world and that every system has produced men and women of the most exalted character. In the face of this evidence, if anybody dreams of the exclusive survival of his own religion and the destruction of others, I pity him from the bottom of my heart and point out to him that upon the banner of every religion will soon be written, in spite of resistance, help and not fight, assimilation and not destruction, harmony and peace and not dissension.